Welcome to Laurier's Teaching Excellence Conversation Series. I'm Mary Wilson, Vice Provost of Teaching and Learning at Wilfrid Laurier University. And today I'm with Paula Fletcher from Laurier's Kinesiology and Physical Education Department, who received the 2022 Faculty Mentoring Award. As a mentor, Paula blends compassion and rigor and helps to set the next generation of scholars up for success. She has been an exceptional mentor at every level, and now as an associate dean and graduate in postdoctoral studies, where she's working to improve mentorship writ large across the institution by helping Laurier faculty develop their own mentoring skills. I'm so excited to learn more about Paula's approach to mentorship and teaching. So Paula, you have such a profound interest in mentorship. You've done a lot of work in this area, a lot of reading, a lot of writing. And I often think that our passion for this sort of aspect of our teaching practice comes from direct experience. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about some of the mentors that you've had in your career and how they influenced you. I think the first mentor I had, although from a very young age, was not academic necessarily, but it was my dad. And my dad's work ethic was always give 110% in whatever you do, whether that is your job, whether that is with your family, whether that was in competitive sport. And move forward a little bit when we, my sister and I became almost teenagers, my dad decided to go back to university because he had not even finished his high school degree, but he ended up graduating with a university degree to be a role model. So from there, that instilled really strong values about having a really good work ethic and giving 110%. Moving forward uh, to when I started academia, there were several mentors I had along the way, but two of the most significant at the beginning of my career were very prolific researchers. Between the two of them, they had over 500 publications. One was my uh, PhD supervisor, who's a driving force in healthcare today in Canada, as well as a man by the name of um, uh, Jim Curtis, who has since passed away. He was a sociologist at UW. But the two of them just showed me the value of teamwork and having a very strong work ethic throughout your entire career and the importance of giving back. When I go forward to more recently, since I've been at Laurier, Probably the three people I respect the most and look to for support would be three female researchers because I can see myself in them or I try to see myself in them. And uh, one would be a woman by the name of Dr. Patricia Rowe. She was the former grad dean at University of Waterloo and one of the first female women professors at University of Waterloo. Uh, she is 87 years old presently. She still mentors students. She still is involved in publications and conferences. And the biggest thing for me was that I was able to get a lot of information for, for, from her throughout the years, but she showed me the really important benefit of maintaining balance. So having a work life, but also having a family life and making priorities for making time for both. Um, and the two other women that I really respect are in my own department. One would be Patricia Rowe's daughter, Pam Bryden, who has been uh, the former chair of our department, has been acting dean of science, is currently the director of CPAC. She is my sounding board. She is the person who I see, have in my head sometimes if I'm making a decision. Uh, she's always very thoughtful in her processes in terms of how she acts and thinks and I often think with my heart a lot more than probably I should. And the second person in my department is Dr. Jane Kellamar, who is the Chair of Research Ethics, who has really changed the process of ethics at Laurier and made it a better process, I think. It might take a little longer, but I truly feel she has made great strides in, in ethics at Laurier. And both of these women also emulate this concept of having balance and making sure their families are a priority, but also being very prolific researchers in their own right. 
and really being amazing with their students. So those are probably the, the people that I would say. Which is so lovely to hear. And also I wonder like if our graduate students realize that we maintain mentors. Right? Absolutely. Throughout our careers and see the persistent value of, of having those role models who inspire us, who set aspirational uh, sort of models for us, uh, and yeah. also help to remind us to both be ourselves and to maintain that balance. Absolutely. And, and that gives us permission um, and to, to you know, engage in our research, be committed to our teaching practice, our service to the institution mm -hmm. that we love, but also to be real people with complex lives and interests and family and friends, and that we need to have that balance so that we can bring our best to our work and to our personal lives and live good lives. Absolutely. I, I totally agree with that. And in all honesty, I'm going to go back to what my dad said, give 110% in everything you do, whether that's your family, whether that's your job, whether that's the service, whether that's the mentorship you're doing at Laurier. And, you know, sometimes my kids will say to me, well, you're really busy on the weekend sometimes. And I say, yeah, but I'm a better mom when I'm a worker, when I do the things that I love, just like I work so that you can do the things that you love. And I think that's okay that we have to find whatever our passion is and, and have mentors in our life lifelong so we continue to do the things that make our hearts sing. So those kind of aspects of mentorship that you talk about mm -hmm. that are so important, and I would absolutely agree that when I think about strong mentors, I think about that encouragement, representation, example, um, friendship, support, and uh, just being invitational and uh, helping people mm -hmm. bring themselves to their studies, their work. How do you make that explicit? Uh, what are the actions that you engage in as a mentor? And I imagine your mentorship skills have evolved quite a bit over time. So can you talk a little bit about how that has changed? How do you see that you've grown in your skill set? Okay, so can I talk about, uh, I think I'll talk about mentorship first and how I approach mentoring a student. I do the same thing with every student pretty much, whether it's an undergrad student all the way up to a, a PhD student. I invite them into my office and I talk about a little bit about me, and then I want to hear about them outside of school, inside of school, what their research goals are, and we talk about expectations. So I will tell them, these are my expectations for you as a student, and this is what you should expect of me as a mentor. And then we talk about a realistic project that they could potentially work on. So all supervisors are different, but I always want my student to be involved in the process of what their project is going to be. I'm not going to hand them a project. And every lab is different, like I said, but I really want them to be at it from the ground all the way up and help decide what their project is. And I can do that in my area. Then I always let them know that my lab is open, uh, even though it's a qualitative space uh, primarily, that they can go in and speak to any of my students. And I encourage them to do so. I want them to meet my students, to see if they fit in with the students that are there. They can ask them anything. And I always tell my, all of my students, you tell them all the good, you tell them all the bad, you tell them what you think I need to improve on. And, and that's OK, because that's the only way that we're going to become better scholars. I also tell them about this life balance that I think is vitally important in being a student, and that I personally would rather have a student that is well balanced and is not driven solely academically. I want them to have other things that fill their lives as well. I also talk about the fact that I like open communication. If there's a problem, I want to know. I want to be involved in the process to solve it. I am very transparent. It might be because I have a, had a hot-blooded Italian mother. I don't know, but I am. I don't like things to be hidden. I want everyone, everything to be on the table. And that's right. the way I try to approach mentorship, that this is me, this is who I am. And you either like the method that I use or I don't. And that's OK. Um, you know, there's different mentors for different people. I also talk about the fact that I want people to give back. Uh, that's very important to me, that I want our lab, 
as a group to give back. And most of the times my students work in a program that we call Moving and Grooving, which is a program for kids with disabilities that is offered free to children. And I want them to understand the importance of giving back to community. So uh, other things I, I try to instill in students is that I want them to become independent workers. I want them to be critical thinkers. That does not mean that I'm not available. I try to meet with students at least once a week sometimes in groups, or I will meet with them singly, depending on the stage of their thesis, but they know they can always come to me. That's what I, like, regardless of the time of the day. Before they start collecting data, if it's an interview, they call me. Bef when they're done, they call me. I want to know how the process is, that they're safe, and that things have gone smoothly, and we have a, a little debrief. So I think those are probably some of the key elements. There's more, but I think, I think that's probably pretty good for now. And then in terms of how I've changed as a mentor, I really thought about this. Um, I've been thinking about this the last little while as I've been involved in, as the associate dean in grad studies. And I think one of the things that has changed me is the more I get involved in the graduate enterprise, the more I see and the more knowledge I try to acquire to make myself a better mentor. One of the other things would be that after I had children, every time I have a student now, I think, how would I want someone to treat my child? And not that I try to mother grad students, that's not what I'm saying, but I just want them to be very, to be treated with the utmost respect and to be given an equal footing, just like every other student in my lab. Every student has a voice. Every student is on the same level doesn't matter if you're a PhD student or an undergrad student, um, you're all given the same value as, as a student in my eyes. That's such brilliant advice, I think, for young educators who are starting to cultivate those mentorship and supervisory skills because you clearly strike a balance between creating culture and community in, in your research lab and among your grad students, I, I love that moving and grooving commitment mm -hmm. because I think it draws them together mm -hmm. and helps them to understand the societal value and responsibility Absolutely. they have um, in uh, setting an expectation for that kind of engagement is really inspirational. And that you also spend time with each of them individually. Uh, and I, I, I think sometimes the further we get from our own graduate experience, mm -hmm. we forget how uh, both intellectually challenging it is, how exhausting it is, and how many of our students struggle at times with imposter syndrome or getting lost in their research and all of the possibilities of it and having to focus in on what they're gonna contribute. Um, what kind of advice would you give to younger colleagues who are encountering either imposter syndrome or students sort of getting lost in the woods uh, yeah. of their research <laughs> yeah. subject matter. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think that all students and faculty need to know that I think any faculty member, any student can experience imposter uh, syndrome throughout their career. And if I can tell a story, that might be easier. So my first real memory of imposter syndrome was when I was a a PhD student. Uh, I, I did get through my PhD studies quite quickly. I was 26 when I graduated. Wow. And when I was 25, and, and the age is important because I felt young. I always felt like I should not be here because of my age. And, and I just felt inadequate. And, but I never let anybody know that. I never told my advisor that. I just went along my day and just you know did as best as I could in studies. And at one point, he came to me and said, I'm going to a conference. You're going to teach a three-hour class. And to preface that, I had never taught a class before. I had never even been a TA. I had, was on scholarship, so they had taken away my TAs because to give them to a student who didn't have a scholarship. And at first, I thought, well, that's great, but what if I want a TA? Like, I want to, but, you know, it was what it was. Another student got funded, so that was fine. And so when he asked me to do the class, I said, 
yeah, I'm not really interested in that. I want to be a researcher. I don't want to be a teacher. Like, I don't want to be a professor. And he said, that wasn't an ask. That was a tell. And I am going away. You have two weeks to get the lecture ready. I'm not going to give you notes. And you're going to do this. It's a topic that you should be able to do. And good luck. And that just mortified me because <laughs> I didn't even know where to start. And so I, the first thing I did was I went to some you know, more senior PhD students. And I went to a professor that was not him. And I know he was trying to teach me some skills that I needed that I didn't have. And I prepared this lecture. And it took me a week and a half to do a three-hour lecture. That's all I did was prepare for this lecture because I needed to know everything <laughs> in the topic just so yeah. that I could answer everything. And when I got to the class, it was a class of about 250. And there were undergrad students in it. And it was cross-listed with master students and PhD students that were younger. And so sure enough, there are about six of my friends sitting halfway up in this big auditorium. And they were kind of giggling at me and laughing because they knew I was nervous. And five minutes into the class, one of the males at the back of the class, right behind these students, started speaking. And that's probably my pet peeve. And so I stopped and I said, one class rule I have is that while I'm teaching and talking, you're not. And then when you want to provide input, then I will give you the same respect and I will make sure no one else talks. And he kind of made a look at me and this proceeded, you know, to happen a few times. And so a few minutes in again, I, I said, I'm sorry, but you're really disruptive to the class. You need to stop talking or you can leave. You don't have to be here. I'm not taking attendance. And he was quiet for about five minutes. And then 10 minutes later, again, the same thing. So now he's kind of getting on my last nerve. And so I said, I'm sorry, but you need to leave right now or stop talking. There's not a choice. I'm not going to continue. And he stood up behind my friends who were now like, what is she going to say? And he says, why should I listen to you? You're younger than I am. And I don't, you can't teach me anything. So I paused for a minute and collected my thoughts. And I said, well, I may be younger than you, but I have two and a half degrees more than you. And so you better sit down and be quiet or get out because I'm not proceeding any further than here. So the students in the class were silent at first and then stood up and started clapping. And the guy left and didn't come back. And so for me, the first message was, I can do this. I, I have to have more faith in my abilities. I really do. And that was the one thing I think I was lacking as a grad student. Sure, I was on scholarship. Sure, I finished quickly. But I didn't have the confidence in myself. And move forward ahead to working at Laurier. And at first, I was pretty timid. And then I got into the groove. And then about three and a half years ago, I got an email. And the email was from Dr. Doug Deutschman, who was the AVP and grad dean of grad studies. And the email had some cartoons on it, like little emojis. And it said, how would you like to join our team? And gave this spiel about grad studies and did I want to be the associate dean. And I thought, OK, who in my department's playing a joke on me. Like, this must be it, because there's no way I'm going to be associate dean. And so I called one of my friends, and I said, did you send this email? Like, I don't know how you got his email on it, but here it is. And she said, I don't know what you're talking about. And so I called. And sure enough, the email was from Dr. Deutschman. And, and I said, you know, I thought this was a joke. And he said, why would you think it's a joke? And I said, because I really didn't think that I was appropriate to be associate dean. And he said, well, why not? You know, you have these skill sets, et cetera, et cetera. And so again, here reared its ugly head that I did not feel I was good enough to do a job that there's no reason why I couldn't have done. I've been at Laurier for 25 years, or 27 years, because two years on contract. And why couldn't I have been associate dean? So my advice to 
students and to younger faculty is always, we're always going to have this little nagging feeling that we're not good enough or that we don't have the training, but just be more confident in your abilities. And, and that's one of the things that I often have to instill in my students. I can't do a conference presentation. Yes, you can. Yes, you can do it. You just have to have confidence in you. I have confidence in you. And you need to take the confidence you have in other people and put it on yourself. So that was a long answer. But, but it's brilliant. Yeah. And I, I think it, you know that message about the importance of both giving opportunity, being supportive, and emboldening ourselves and our students is really key. Uh, what do you think we need to do to build mentorship skills among faculty? So I know that one of the things that you have contributed very generously is a guide to mentorship that's on my lesson is available to all of our uh, instructors. What else do we need to do within departments across the university? What do you think would make a difference? Yeah. If I can go back to the mentorship guide. so. When I uh, got here at, at to Laurier, and like I said, I had not taught except for this one class, and I got a job shortly, like about a year later at Laurier, and I literally had no teaching experience, no mentorship experience, no nothing. And again, I was quite nervous about how am I going to do this? And when I walked in the door the first day, a faculty member had said to me, um, do you want to co-supervise a student with me? And I'm thinking, no, I don't. <laughs> like, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I just got out of it myself. But I, I thought, okay, let's do this. And a, a few days later, I received a call. And I can't even remember what department it was from. But they asked me if I wanted to have a mentor. I could have a mentor at the faculty level. And I could also have a member, like a, a mentor at the department level. So I jumped on that bandwagon because I thought, this is going to be great. I can ask about teaching. I can ask about mentorship. I have this person one-on-one -on -one and thought this was great. And you know, I used the mentors throughout the years for the first year or two, maybe three, and sometimes even later than that, I would you know, go to uh, the person, Dr. Kathy Cameron in math was my uh, mentor. And when I applied for ten tenure, I asked her some questions, for example, and then move ahead to when I became associate dean, and I started to look at what we had for mentorship. Well, we had nothing. We didn't have a module. We didn't even have the mentorship program anymore. And this really disheartened me because I was thinking, well, what if someone comes in like I did, where I didn't have any mentoring experience or teaching experience or these things that we needed, or well, I needed, to put me on course? And so I said to the dean at the time, I would like to do a mentorship module. And so at the time, um, we were working with two people in teaching and learning closely on some other projects. And uh, Brent Wolf, who's now the acting dean, and the four of us were going to do this mentorship module. And then things happened, and we got busy, and we kind of it fell off our radar. And then I said, OK, in order to get this done, I'm going to apply for some funding for a graduate student to help me do this. And so I applied for funding through the Graduate Enhancement Fund. And my PhD student, who was almost done her PhD, was the student I selected because she had been here for several years. And so I mapped out pretty much what I wanted to be in the module and then uh, you know, obtained most of the sources. And then she wrote good chunks of it. And then we went back and forth to get it perfect or what, how we wanted it. Then we had someone from teaching and learning also um, look at it. Actually, a few people, three or four people looked at it and vetted it. We had Hina Mystery from EDI mm -hmm. vetted as well because we felt that there needed to be an EDI component in it. And you know, it took, it took longer uh, with it being only myself and a student. But I think it got to a good place that at least we now have at least a foundation to start from. If you go to other universities' websites, they have phenomenal things for mentorship. University of Toronto has a center for mentorship that faculty can draw on. Uh, University of Calgary has a center as well, and many mentorship modules. And so 
our one module at least is a start for us that we can build on and I really think we need to build on it. Now maybe not everybody needs to have a mentorship module and can find mentors in their own way or can find uh, resources to help them or maybe they're naturally a good mentor. I was not. I needed some guidance at least to say you're, you know you're on the right track and these are some things that you can do. So in terms of what else we can do beside this mentorship module, I love the program that the Office of Research now has for incoming faculty. I think it's great steps and it even goes beyond the mentor that I was given uh, when I started so many years ago. So I think that's a good step. I think one of the other things that needs to happen at Laurier in terms of the culture is that mentorship needs to be more appreciated. These awards are a first step and they are, it warms my heart that, that I received the award, but at the same time there are so many deserving faculty that mentor, mentor, mentor so many students and are not acknowledged. And I'm not saying everyone should get an award, uh, but I do think that the university needs to acknowledge mentorship more. And if that means that it's a course remission for so many students supervised or whatever that is, I think that might be a really good first step uh, or a second step. Uh, another thing is I think that faculty should really embrace each other and provide mentorship to each other. I know informally in our department there are several people that I can go to and they can come to me I hope but I'm hoping that other departments do that as well and that it's an open discussion about how we can become better mentors. Yeah I quite like that notion of making it very visible um, mm -hmm. and accessible so with, that when you join a a faculty, you join a department, it's evident to you how to get engaged with one or more mentors Absolutely. and that you can anticipate what, what is to come of that from a foundational level and then of course the relationships evolve over time. Um, but it strikes me that there's, there's something distinctively valuable about mentorship within fields of study, within disciplines. Mm -hmm. Um, you, through your work with grad studies, see different departmental uh, approaches to mentorship and supervision. Can you comment a little bit about the ways in which you think disciplinary focus, the traditions of knowing within the, you know, the sciences or the humanities or the social sciences might influence uh, mentorship in meaningful ways and, and how we might need to attend to that too as we develop more opportunities across Laurier for people to really cultivate these skills. Uh, I, I'm going to just draw on a conference that Brent Wolf and I just attended last week. We were at CAGS which is the Canadian Association for Graduate Students. So there were deans and associate deans and various administrators and staff and grad students alike from across Canada at this conference and some people from the states as well. And it was all about mentorship and various things about the graduate enterprise. The one thing that I noticed, because I went to every single session on mentorship that I could, was that there are some key foundational aspects that regardless of the discipline were available. And, or were talked about by the speakers. And so I think at the foundation, there might be some key aspects that everyone can draw on uh, in terms of mentoring. But at the same time, there might be some differences in terms of nuances based on what discipline you're in. And so I'll use my own discipline, for example. So I teach in kinesiology but my research is in primarily the lived experience of individuals with chronic illnesses or disabilities or pediatric cancer. So the person that has it plus their family network. And so right off the bat when my students come in I bring to the table my experience. And I'm very open and somewhat vulnerable when I talk about the experiences so I let students know that 
my brother passed away at three years old from neuroblastoma. My parents provided care to him in our family home until when he was deemed palliative and he eventually died in the home. And so looking at the lived experiences of families facing pediatric cancer is important to me from a personal perspective. And that's a tool that I use going forward into my research. Uh, the same thing now in the past 15 years, I provided care to both my parents with my sisters. Uh, my mom had a very debilitating illness called spinal cerebellar ataxia. And she essentially started to lose every function and slowly progressed for 10 years with this disease. Five years in, my dad developed dementia. And so trying to navigate caring for both of them with very different um, diseases, one all cognitive, the other all physical, but 100% cognitive, the intact, really provided some good experience, not good experience, but good insight into what caregivers go through when they're caring for age-related changes or diseases in seniors. So I use that in my research and I share those experiences and that's what I want my students to do. I want them to share their experiences. If they want to, then no, no one ever needs to, but what do they bring to the table and what do they need to acknowledge? What can they use as a tool in qualitative research when they start interviewing? And how does that impact or affect the way they look at disability or illness? So I think in that way, just using that one example, there will be all different ways, depending on the field that researchers can bring in their information or their lived experience, whatever that is, and affect their mentorship. I can't speak to what a physicist or a chemist would do, but I am sure there are, there are things that are in their background that they're going to bring forward and try to bring uh, forward in their, in their research uh, and, and in their teaching. It could also be that there are different things in our backgrounds or our ethnicities yep. that are important. And one of mine is families important is number one. So if you have something going on with your family, then we will stop, set aside what's going on academically and you're going to deal with the family issue first because you can't be 100% invested if you have an issue that you need to deal with at home. So, you know, there's a lot of things that different supervisors might draw on and I encourage supervisors to be their authentic selves and bring forward who they are as people and what they find important. It's, it's a thread that you've pulled through the entire conversation and I think it is uh, really important for us to reinforce that uh, as members of an academic community, that the attention that you pay to the cultivation of knowledge and skills mm -hmm. Um, matters in, enormously, of course, and that there are common attributes to that, but there are also very distinctive disciplinary or professional right. aspects that you're best situated to help your students, your uh, young colleagues understand the scope, the, the map of the territory uh, that, that they're traversing, but then also this idea about the humanity and the values mm -hmm. and that that reminder that what we do in higher ed is not just the study of life, it's also the stuff of life. And absolutely. that we are very much absolutely in a, uh, a societal, societal conversation. Absolutely. Um, and you gotta bring yourself to yep. it in all of your diversity and to, to be deliberate about that um, and to remind people of the importance of that so that we don't right. get too focused on abstraction or the more sort of clinical or you know, higher level uh, technical aspects of the work that we do and remember the humanity of all of this, right. I think is actually one of the things that attracted me to Laurier was that that is, I don't know, it's kind of etched into the memory of the institution mm -hmm. somehow and starts to mm -hmm. permeate yeah. when people join it. So that's yeah. brilliant to know yeah. as well. Um, so I, I want to ask you as, as well, like so many of our students go on uh, to 
careers and professions, um, and not all of them go on in the professoriate, in academia. What do you think we need to pay attention to when we're mentoring students for that broad possibility? I think one of the things that we need to do is we need to be honest with our students and upfront before they come in and throughout the entire process, have conversations about what is it that you want to do and just keep going back to check on what they want to do and provide them with discussions or opportunities that you know other students have done. So it's not very easy to get a faculty job anymore. Any PhD student that comes in, I discuss that with them. Yeah. You may end up getting a faculty job, but you may not. So let's have a plan B. Or maybe that's not even their plan A. Right. So I always give them different options about where they can be. I always connect them with my former students who are in various positions, some academic, some not, uh, some in straight research jobs, some in community-based agencies. And any student that wants to get connected with one of my former students, the door's always open there, and my students always are willing to come back. Um, I just had some, uh, an occupational therapist and a physical therapist who were in our grad program and then got masters in rehab. They came back to my aging class and talked very openly about the field of occupational therapy and physical therapy. So I always try to draw on resources or students that have come, that have left Laurier and they're always willing to come back or they're always willing to talk to people about where they are and what they do. So just letting students know that they have to have an open mind and that the path they think they might go on might not be where they end up and that's okay. Like I didn't end up where I thought I was going to be. I assumed I was going to be uh, absorbed into Shadok McMaster's research centers in health and not teach at all and, that, and that's not where I am. I am so glad <laughs> that that is the outcome. Uh, I think that uh, you have shared many practical pearls of wisdom, but also such a great sort of orientation to thinking about mentorship and its broad application for undergraduate, graduate students, and for our faculty colleagues, and also the personal importance of having and keeping mentors in our lives um, that will both inspire uh, our our colleagues and also I think um, probably attract some more questions <laughs> and outreach for you. Uh, so I can't thank you enough for the conversation. It's been absolutely delightful uh, and so grateful for the work that you've done on the, on the mentorship guide and hopeful that you'll continue along this path uh, to help us develop these mechanisms across Laurier. Thank you for honoring me with this award. I, uh, I have loved speaking to you, and my door is always open for people that want to chat about mentorship. Thank you so very much. My thanks to Paula Fletcher for joining me today, and I hope that you'll join me for more conversations that celebrate exceptional teaching practices, explore diverse teaching philosophies, and discuss the future of higher education, teaching, and learning.